Our speaker this evening is Professor of Theology at the Franciscan University of Steubenville. Dr. John Bergsma served as a Protestant pastor for four years before entering the Catholic Church in 2001 while pursuing a PhD from the University of Notre Dame, specializing in the Old Testament and the Dead Sea Scrolls. A close collaborator of Dr. Scott Hahn, Dr. Bergsma speaks regularly on Catholic radio and at conferences and parishes both nationally and internationally. He's written numerous academic and popular publications, including the books Bible Basics for Catholics and New Testament Basics for Catholics from Ave Maria Press. He and his wife, Dawn, reside with their eight children in Steubenville, Ohio. It is my great joy and honor to welcome Dr. John Bergsma. It's great to be talking about Advent. And strangely, uh, there's scarcely anything more appropriate to discuss during Advent than the Dead Sea Scrolls. And that's a little counterintuitive, like what would the scrolls have to do with Advent? And uh, we're gonna see how that all comes into play, how it all works together in, uh, as this talk develops. But let's start off with the concept of Advent, which of course means coming or arrival in Latin. And uh, the question is, what are we waiting for uh, during Advent? Well, one of the things that we do during Advent is we kind of spiritually place ourselves back into the posture of the ancient Israelites, and we uh, re-expect the coming of the Messiah. In fact, that uh, beautiful uh, song, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, uh, really does that liturgically. If you think about the words that song, uh, we are uh, associating ourselves and placing ourselves back in history with the people of Israel and um, imagining ourselves waiting for the coming of the Messiah for the first time. Well, what? who was the Messiah? What was the Messiah? What were they waiting for? The main figure for the uh, Messiah was David, uh, the royal, the, the great king, you know, the, the King Arthur of Israel's tradition. So he was a person of history, not of legend, right? We have his name on at least three, what we call stele, which are um, inscribed monuments from uh, ancient times. So we have external non-biblical attestation of David's reign. He was the founder of a dynasty because subsequently his kingdom was called the House of David, and that's how it was referred to in uh, these ancient uh, archaeological records that we have access to. But he reigned from about 1010 to about 970 BC, establishing a dynasty uh, that reigned all the way till 586. And by the way, brothers and sisters, that was the longest lived ancient Near Eastern dynasty. Not the wealthiest, not the most powerful, but the longest lived. That was about 400 years that David and his descendants ruled over the kingdom of Judah, far outlasting any of the dynasties of the pharaohs, of uh, the Mesopotamian kings, etc. And um, uh, the last reigning king uh, in the line of David was deposed around 586, 587, when Jerusalem was destroyed. Of course, we remember how the Jews were taken to Babylon and then began to come back about 50 years later after uh, the emperor Cyrus uh, defeated the Babylonians and released all the Babylonian captives. And so beginning in the 530s and extending into about 450 or so, we have waves of Jews coming back from Babylon. They rebuild Jerusalem. They rebuild Judea but the Persians do not allow them to set a son of David on the throne. And so that son of David is not visibly reigning over them, but the prophets had said that he would come back. So Annie, we can put up slide three with a famous prophecy from Isaiah, and we'll read that. This is from Isaiah 11, which the Liturgy of the Hours um, 
uh, reserves for Christmas Day, actually. This is what we read on Christmas Day in the Office of Readings. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. Okay, Jesse is David's father. So that's a poetic way of talking about the dynasty of David. And a branch shall grow out of his roots. Let me mention, one of the words for branch in Hebrew is netzer. And that is the basis of the town name Netzereth. Uh, if you if we had to render Netzereth into English, it would come out something like Branchton. And so in uh, Matthew, uh, Matthew 1 and 2, uh, the gospel writer uh, remarks on that and, uh, and, and regards the coming of the Messiah from Branchton as a fulfillment of these prophecies of a branch uh, coming from the line of uh, David. And in hindsight, it's so, it's, it's so poetically uh, obvious. How could we have missed it that the branch comes from Branchton, okay, that the Netzer comes from Netzereth. So moving on here, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding. With righteousness, he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. Okay, so a, a uh, son of David is going to come who is going to have the Holy Spirit resting upon him. And then Jeremiah uh, reads, and we can put up slide four here. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I'll raise up for David a righteous branch. There we get Netzer again. And he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved. Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. That's profound. The Messiah is going to bring God's righteousness and uh, make it available for all God's people. Of course, that's through the Holy Spirit. So we could talk a lot about that. Uh, if we wanted to, but we have to move quickly tonight. And uh, let's just read one more prophecy from the Old Testament from Ezekiel here, Ezekiel 34. I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David shall be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken." I will make with them a covenant of peace and banish wild beasts from the land so that they may dwell securely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. So there's Ezekiel predicting that uh, the Messiah is going to come, the son of David, and he's going to restore uh, the peace of the Garden of Eden. And you might wonder, well, how did Jesus do that? To super quick cut to the chase. Every time you go into a Catholic parish, you are returning to Eden because the river of life that flowed out of Eden is right there in the baptismal font, and the tree of life that bears the fruit of life, of eternal life, from which you can eat and live forever, is right up on the altar there. And so every Catholic parish brings you what is most important about Eden, which is the life-giving drink and the life-giving food. Well, so the the people of Israel were waiting for this son of David that Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Jeremiah, and others, Micah, Zephaniah, etc., had all predicted would come. And some among the Jews were very, very serious about waiting in anticipation for this anointed royal son of David. In fact, a group that we call the Essenes, we can put up slide six here. Um, we, we know very much about, well, almost all Christians are quite familiar with two of the three sects of Jews that were prevalent in Jesus's day. The, the two that everyone knows about are the Pharisees and the Sadducees because they're mentioned by name in the Gospels. There was a third sect that called themselves simply Israelites, but outsiders called them Essenes. And uh, this is the group that left us the Dead Sea Scrolls. They were a branch of Judaism that stressed personal holiness, practiced celibacy, studied a lot of inspired books. They had a very big, you know, Bible, so to speak. They included books that nowadays we would think of as apocryphal. They were renowned and respected for their holiness, kept to themselves, 
and lived in waiting for the Messiah. And as they did so, they did not participate in the Jerusalem temple worship because they regarded the temple as uh, defiled. And again, as I said, this Essene group is the one that left us the Dead Sea Scrolls. You can put up the next slide, Anna, Annie, and uh, show folks. The, these are the limestone bluffs that line the Dead Sea. That's Cave 4 there uh, in the middle. That's where over half of the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. And uh, what these caves were, were actually sleeping areas for the monks who lived down on the uh, plain that was below these bluffs. And uh, when the Roman soldiers came to wipe them out near the year 70, they hid their scrolls in their caves where they would usually sleep at night and uh, Providence preserved them for us. Andy, we could put up this slide that shows um, the, the scrolls as they were found. Uh, when, when these caves were first discovered, brothers and sisters, back in the 40s, there were many of these jars in the caves that uh, we later discovered the monks um, at this community actually made specifically to hold the scrolls. And over there on the right, you can see um, uh, some of the scrolls as they were found in a semi-deteriorated condition. And Annie, we can put up slide nine, which shows uh, two of the three discoverers of the scrolls. They were found by uh, a trio of Arab Bedouin shepherds who were driving their flocks along the shore of the Dead Sea, and one of them threw a rock into a cave mouth, heard the breaking of pottery. They went in to investigate and discovered the first of uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls. What location are we talking about? Well, Annie, we can put up slide uh, 10 there, and this shows us the Dead Sea, and you see up at the northwest corner, uh, you have a site that scholars call Qumran, uh, that was the location where the Essenes sponsored a monastery uh, in the last century BC and the first century AD. So overlapping with the life and uh, the career of our Lord. So what did they do at this uh, monastery? Well, they did the things that monks do. Uh, here's, here's a close-up, in fact, of one of the cave mouths. Um, again, they use these caves for sleeping because the Dead Sea area, of course, is, is very warm uh, during the day and even into the evening, but these limestone caves kind of were naturally cooled by the moisture in the rock. Now, this image that you're seeing, the floor of the cave has been cleaned out. It's very nice and attractive and you can walk in there, but that's not the condition when these caves were discovered. Um, most of these caves were covered in the bottom with up to six feet of bat guano. And the scrolls were often in jars at the bottom of all that bat doo-doo. And that was actually providential because being buried under all the bat guano that kept them in what we call an anaerobic environment, an oxygen-free environment, and therefore they did not age. So when they were dug out and brought out, oftentimes the scrolls were supple, they had beautiful color, and that was because they were buried under all of that bat stuff. And uh, brothers and sisters, I find great theological significance in that. If you feel like the Lord is allowing you to be dumped on with a heap of stuff and it just keeps coming, it may just be that the Lord has a providential purpose for you and is keeping you for a special reason. Uh, because we give thanks to, to the Lord for these scrolls that now shed so much light on the New Testament. Um, Annie, we could just flip through quickly uh, slides 12 and uh, 13, 14, uh, and so on. Just g give everybody a few seconds to look at this. I want you to, to get an impression of uh, the monastic um, dwellings that were on this site and uh, what they look like to go there. Take note of this one, brothers and sisters, because this is what we call a mcveigh. Uh, or a ritual bath. There were a lot of those on the site. 
and uh, they were fed by, uh, we could put up slide 16 there. Uh, they had an aqueduct system at the monastery that ran up into the wadis, we would call them arroyos up in the hills. And during the torrential rains that happened for about two weeks in the winter, it would fill up all their ritual baths and their cisterns. And we can put up slide 17 that kind of shows an overview. This is, this is an overview of their buildings. And then you can see their water system. And uh, because they had all their cisterns and their ritual baths connected to uh, the, uh, the ravines, uh, they all filled up during the winter rains and they typically did not have to make use of uh, wells or, or um, you know, uh, pulling water up from any kind of depth. And so it was uh, quite, uh, uh, quite innovative on their part. So what were these monks doing out in the desert? Well, interestingly, when we read in the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, some of their core documents, uh, like uh, what's called the Community Rule, which uh, is the document that guided their common life and gave their theology, their worldview, their sacramental practice, and uh, the major rules of, of their common living, we see that they cite uh, in a very significant way Isaiah 40 verse 3. Uh, of course, a voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. They cite that as justification, theological justification, for why they were in the desert. And they took this verse literally. They understood it as a call from the Lord to go out into the desert and prepare for the Messiah. And they, they weren't so primitive as to think that, you know, they, they had to make physical preparations or like build a physical road. Uh, but rather, they understood that what was being called for was a spiritual preparation. But they, the bit about the wilderness, uh, they took with utmost seriousness. Now, when we read the Bible, you need, we need to take all of our directions and our geographical indications uh, from the perspective of Jerusalem. Most of the Bible is written from the perspective of Jerusalem. So if you speak about the wilderness or the desert, from Jerusalem, what you mean is the eastern desert where the terrain drops thousands of feet till you're on the lowest place on the face of the planet down by the Dead Sea, and it's very dry, it's very barren, it's like the American Southwest down there. And that is the wilderness or the desert in, in um, it's called the Midbar in Hebrew. And so, uh, the prophet cries to go prepare for the Lord in the wilderness. And if you look on a map uh, showing Qumran in Jerusalem, you'll see that the Qumran monastery is directly east of Jerusalem. And so they literally went straight out east into the desert until they hit the Dead Sea. And apparently there they could go no farther because of the water. And so they decided to, as it were, set up shop there and begin their spiritual preparations for the coming of the Messiah. And so these, these uh, ancient Jewish Essenes um, were li literally living a lifelong Advent. I mean, we live Advent for four weeks uh, out of the liturgical year every year, but their entire lives were one long Advent as they prayed together, studied the scriptures together, especially the prophet Isaiah. And that's significant, okay, because Isaiah is so associated with the coming of the Messiah. You'll notice in the lectionary for this time of year that the, um, the weekday masses, our first reading is predominantly chosen from Isaiah during Advent. If you read the Liturgy of the Hours, the Office of the Readings works through Isaiah during Advent. And in years A and B, the first reading in Sunday Masses is usually from Advent. Now, it's a little bit unusual this year because we're in year C. And in year C, we take a break from Isaiah. Excuse me, I may have misspoken myself. The uh, first reading is taken from Isaiah in years A and B. But in year C, we, we take a... Uh, 
a, a collection of minor prophets like Zephaniah and Micah and so on for the first reading during Sunday Masses in Advent. But normally, again, in years B, A and B, it is Isaiah that we, um, that we read from. And uh, we find that Isaiah is the most cited prophet in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, they understood him to be speaking about the age to come, about, it, they understood him to be describing the Messianic age, and they were engaged in preparations. Now, as we've been discussing this, you may have had your minds go to another figure who associates himself with Isaiah 40, verse 3. Uh, and you may have thought about uh, John the Baptist, who, of course, when he is asked to identify who he is in salvation history, also appeals to Isaiah 40, verse 3, and describes himself as the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. I do not think that's accidental. Uh, it is too much of a coincidence in my mind that both John the Baptist and the monks at uh, Qumran, these Essene monks, are both associating themselves with Isaiah 40 verse 3, and nobody else is. The Pharisees aren't, the Sadducees aren't, really nobody else in Judaism at this time is doing anything with Isaiah 40 verse 3, but these two uh, uh, agents are the, the monks and John the Baptist. Not only that, but uh, both the monks and John the Baptist are performing water washings um, near the Jordan River in basically the same uh, area of the land of Israel. And they have a, a number of other practices in common as well. So in my book, Jesus in the Dead Sea Scrolls, I argue that John the Baptist was probably raised by these monks. And I think this makes a lot of sense out of scripture because Luke 180 says that John was in the wilderness until he began his public ministry. Have you ever thought about how odd that really is? You know, do we expect that Elizabeth and Zachariah, you know, shooed him out of the house at age five and said, time to go to the desert, John. Uh, I hear the grasshoppers are good eating, you know, how did, how exactly did that work? Um, but the Jewish historian Josephus tells us that the Essenes lived in the desert and that they raised um, boys that they chose from the larger Israelite community and formed them in their manners. He even uses the term formed like we do for formation. So we know that the monks uh, took in boys and raised them. They were very conservative. The monks were very theologically conservative. They had a fantastic library. It would be like sending your son to a Benedictine monastery to be raised, and maybe you hope that he has that he gets a vocation from that. That's how uh, people used to uh, behave in the Middle Ages, for example. So I imagine that um, Zachariah and Elizabeth either sent John to be raised by the monks, or maybe they predeceased John and their, their relatives sent John out. But I suspect that's what's being referred to in Luke 180. And then we observe John eating off the land. He, he's eating uh, honey and, uh, you know, the, uh, the locusts. Now, what is going on with that? We, we, we just tend to think, well, John was eccentric. Well, it was not that John was eccentric. The Jewish historian Josephus tells us that when uh, monks were excommunicated from the monastery, they often starved to death because when they made final vows to enter the monastery, they swore never to eat food prepared outside the monastery for the rest of their life. And thus, if they offended the community and got kicked out, they were still bound by their oath uh, not to eat food prepared anywhere else. Now, there was a loophole they could eat grass and bark and things that weren't exactly food and weren't prepared. And John the Baptist record, excuse me, Josephus mentions other people, other like hermit figures out along the Jordan River who are similar to John eating off the land like grass and bark and stuff like that. So putting this all together, I suspect that John got himself kicked out of the monastery 
And that's why he's eating off the land, eating unprepared foods. It makes a lot of sense based on what the historian Josephus tells us. But like the monks, he's practicing a water washing that's associated with the coming of the Holy Spirit. The monks thought the Holy Spirit had already come. John is very clear. The Holy Spirit has not come yet. The Messiah will bring the Holy Spirit. So maybe they had a falling out about the theology of the Holy Spirit, and that's how John got himself kicked out. There's other possibilities as well. I suspect, too, that John wanted to bring salvation. He wanted to preach salvation to a broader audience. When we read the Dead Sea Scrolls, we find that the, uh, the monks refused to preach to those who were outside the community. What we find John the Baptist doing, like in this coming, uh, the coming readings for weeks two and three of Advent, we're going to see him preaching to everybody, even the Roman soldiers, even the tax collectors. The monks refuse to do that. But Isaiah says that salvation has to go out to all the people, that means all Israel, and to all the nations. And I think that John the Baptist, who really was in love with Isaiah, really associated himself with the prophet Isaiah, I think that John imbibed that zeal to preach the gospel universally, preach the coming of the Messiah to everyone. And when he got kicked out of the monastery, his strategy was this. He went up to the fords of the Jordan, which were across from Jericho. And there you had the crossing of trade routes. It was like O'Hare Airport, okay? Everybody has to make a connection there. And so if you set up a pulpit in O'Hare, you can preach to the whole world without moving an inch from where you're standing because the whole world's going to pass by in front of you. And that was, that's what John was doing at the Fords of the Jordan. You got these trade routes. There's literally people from all over the known world from the Roman Empire, from the Persian Empire, they're all crossing there with spices and silks and, you know, whatever you can imagine. And he can preach to the whole world uh, simply by standing in one place at the fords of the Jordan. And he was so effective. He was really the Billy Graham of his generation. Um, he was so effective that later in the book of Acts, I believe it's in Acts chapter 19, we're going to see Paul encountering disciples of John the Baptist as far away as what we now know of as Western Turkey, decades and decades after the death of John the Baptist. So John the Baptist is really re very remarkable uh, figure uh, in salvation history. He gets more feast days than anybody uh, except Jesus and the Blessed Mother. And notice that his main feast day is June 25th, which is set up right in between Christmases, kind of like the moon to the sun uh, with, with Jesus. The, the Holy Mother Church is trying to tell us that John the Baptist is a very important person, and we're going to see a little bit more about why he's so important uh, right now. Um, Annie, let's put up slide 19. Um, the Essenes, we said that they were living a lifelong Advent, and they actually expected two Messiahs. We see this in one of their major documents, which scholars call the Damascus document, it gives the history of their movement. And one of the things it says is, this is the exp exposition of the regulations by which they shall be governed in the age of wickedness until the appearance of the Messiahs of Aaron and of Israel. The Messiah of Aaron was their priestly Messiah, and the Messiah of Israel was the royal Messiah from the line of David. Now, why would they get this crazy idea that they were going to get a priestly Messiah and a royal Messiah. Well, Annie, let's put up slide 20. It's because prophets like Jeremiah promised that the covenant with David and the covenant with Levi would never be broken. Jeremiah 33, if you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night, then also my covenant with David, my servant may be broken, and my covenant with the Levitical priests. So because Jeremiah says this, the Essenes figured that God would be faithful to these two covenants and would one day bring a savior figure from the line of David and from the line of Levi. And again, in Zechariah, let's put up slide 21, Annie. Um, Zechariah says, then I said to them, what are these two olive trees on the right and the left of the lampstand? He said to me, do you not know what these are? I said, no. And then he said, these are the two anointed who stand by the Lord of the whole earth. So, um, 
looking at this passage, the Essenes and other Jews as well uh, were expecting uh, two anointed figures to come at the end of uh, time. And uh, that was the dominant uh, kind of view of the Messiah that we see in the Dead Sea Scrolls. However, one document among the Dead Sea Scrolls has a minority report. Let's put up uh, slide 22, Annie. There's a document scholars call 11Q Melchizedek. It was found in the 11th cave, and it's about Melchizedek. And it's a prophecy of the return of Melchizedek at the end of time. And this is an English translation of part of this prophecy. It says, concerning what the scripture says, in this year of Jubilee, you shall return. The interpretation is that it applies to the last days, and it concerns the captives, just as Isaiah said, to proclaim the Jubilee to the captives, Isaiah 61.1. Melchizedek will return them to what is rightfully theirs. He will proclaim to them the Jubilee, thus releasing them from the debt of all their sins. Wow, now, I know that's a lot to take in, but let's just summarize what's going on. The Essenes are saying that Isaiah 61 is referring to a end times year of Jubilee. That was the year of freedom that came every 50 years. And uh, Melchizedek was going to return and he was going to proclaim this supernatural Jubilee. And unlike the old Jubilee that freed you from, from your money debt, this Jubilee was going to free you from your sin debt. Okay, your sin debt. And let's put up the next slide, Annie, 23. Uh, this is continuing to read from 11Q Melchizedek, one of the Dead Sea Scrolls. It is written concerning him, he says to Zion, your God reigns, quoting Isaiah 52, 7. Now, Zion is the sons of righteousness who uphold the covenant and turn from walking in the way of the people. Notice how they do what we call a typological interpretation of Zion and understand it as the faithful community. We do the same thing as Christians. And your God is Melchizedek, who will deliver them from the power of Belial. Look at, brothers and sisters, isn't that interesting? They are interpreting a statement about God and referring it to a human being, a priest king named Melchizedek. So they were expecting a divine priest king who would come and deliver them from Satan, because Belial is their term for uh, Satan. So let's sum up here. Annie, we can put up uh, slide 24. Um, the Essenes were expecting that Melchizedek would come back and proclaim the Jubilee. Uh, he would free the righteous from the debt of sin. He would free God's people from slavery to Satan. And, um, and they associated him with God. Okay. So what does that mean for us? Well, let's go to the Gospel of Luke and let's think about how the Gospel of Luke begins. Have you ever noticed that Luke does not begin with the birth of Jesus, not even with the Annunciation of Jesus? It begins with the Annunciation of John the Baptist. And whose son is John the Baptist? Why? Oh, well, of course, he's Zachariah and Elizabeth's son. But what was Zachariah? What did he do for a living? He was a priest. Well, from whom did you have to descend to be a priest? You had to descend from Levi. So I would argue to you, brothers and sisters, that Luke is writing his gospel for his contemporaries, and he knows that many of his contemporaries were expecting a Messiah from the line of Levi. And for those who were expecting that, he gives them John the Baptist. And so we have this account in Luke 1 about the annunciation to Zechariah about the coming miraculous birth of John, who I will dare to say is the priestly Messiah. And only then, we can put up the next slide, do we move to the annunciation uh, to our Blessed Mother. And there we stress again and again uh, Jesus's descent from David, you know, Joseph of the house of David, and then Gabriel says he's going to 
a uh, reign on the throne of his father David over the house of Jacob. So clearly, Jesus is what the Essenes would have called the Messiah of Israel, the royal Messiah from the line of David. And let's go to the next slide, Annie, and look at uh, Luke 4. So this is the inaugural sermon of our Lord uh, when he goes to his hometown and preaches. He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. He went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He stood up to read. They gave him Isaiah. He opened the book to where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. Brothers and sisters, this is Isaiah 61. Um, to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Notice, brothers and sisters, this is the same passage that the Essenes monks quoted in, Isaiah, in uh, 11 Q Melchizedek, and they associated it with the coming of Melchizedek, who was going to proclaim the Jubilee year and free them from sin and from Satan. So Jesus chooses this passage, and you and I have to understand, this was a controversial passage in Jesus' day. This was a freighted, um, uh, impactful passage that was being debated among the Jews uh, about what did it mean. And, and one of the three great sects, the three great divisions among Judaism, took this passage and uh, referred it to the priest king Melchizedek in his return. And of course, what does our Lord do? Well, he closed the book, he gives it back to the attendant and sits down. Now, brothers and sisters, I never understood this because for us, our preachers preach standing and when they're done with the homily, they sit down. And so I read this all my life and thought when Jesus sat down, that meant, well, he's not giving a homily, right? Like a daily mass, you know, if the priest just, uh, you know, sits down after the reading or just goes straight to the, uh, to the prayers of the people or whatever, that like you're not going to get a homily. So I'm like, why are they all staring at him if he's not going to give a homily? But what we have to understand is this is not Catholicism. This is Judaism. And in Judaism, you preach from a chair. It's called the chair of Moses. And it's referred to by our Lord elsewhere, like in, in uh, Matthew. You know, he says they sit on the seat of Moses. And so you got to listen to them. So when Jesus sits down on the chair in the synagogue, that actually means he's going to give a homily. So when he sits down, everybody gets excited. Oh, we're going to get a homily today. Okay, not only is he going to read, but he's going to preach on this passage. What is he going to say about this passage? Because the TV preachers say it's about Melchizedek who's going to return. What is Jesus of Nazareth going to say about it? And he says, today this scripture has been fulfilled and you're hearing. It's like, I'm the one. <laughs> okay, I'm the one this is talking about. It ain't talk I'm not going to say it's not talking about Melchizedek because in a sense it is, he is the Melchizedek, but he identifies himself, I am the person spoken of in this passage. Well, that is electric. That is, that is electric. That, that goes like wildfire through all of Galilee, through all the Jewish communities, because you've got a rabbi claiming to be the fulfillment of this highly controversial passage that was associated with uh, the return of this priest king. Well, okay, Jesus. So, um, you know, talk is cheap. What are you going to do to back up this claim that you are this anointed one from God? Well, brothers and sisters, this is so fascinating. I only saw this about four years ago when I was finishing up my book, Jesus and the Dead Sea Scrolls, and I was researching Luke and the scrolls. Never seen this. Nobody I know None of the secondary literature, none of the other scholars that I'm aware of have seen this connection. But if you look in Luke 4 and you go down from that passage where he was preaching, one of the next units that you find is the account of Jesus encountering a demoniac in Capernaum, and he casts Satan out of this man. Well, what did the Essenes expect Melchizedek to do? To release people from the power of Belial, which is Satan. So here Jesus is doing it. Well, what was the other thing they expected Melchizedek to do? To free people from the power of 
sin. So what do we do? We go to the next chapter. And what do we have in Luke 5? There we've got the account of the paralytic being lowered down from the roof in front of Jesus. And what does Jesus say to the man? He says, man, your sins are forgiven. And the Pharisees object, etc. But the Essenes are probably thinking, whoa, this dude is the Melchizedek. He's doing what we expected. He's proclaiming release from sin and from Satan. And so let's uh, sum up and we can put up a uh, slide 32, uh, Anna. Um, in the perspective of the Dead Sea Scrolls, okay, this is what Luke is doing. And, and now, brothers and sisters, we're in year C. And so we're reading the Gospel of Luke this year. And all of our readings from Advent, for all the Gospel readings from Advent, are taken from Luke. Okay, so we're really getting into this Gospel this year. And the Dead Sea Scrolls give us a perspective on what St. Luke is doing. He's writing to his contemporaries, and he's saying to them, if you want a priestly Messiah and a royal Messiah, you got it in John the Baptist and in Jesus of Nazareth, one from the line of Levi, one from the line of, of Judah, from David, and they have come to usher in the era of, um, of fulfillment. And on the other hand, uh, if you're expecting Melchizedek, which a few of the Essenes were, Luke shows you that Jesus is doing everything that they expected Melchizedek to do when he comes back. Free people from the power of Belial, that is the devil, uh, forgiving people their debt of sins, and basically acting like he thinks he's God, because he is. You know, that divine God is Melchizedek. Remember that they were open to the idea of a divine human figure. So I think that uh, Luke is presenting Jesus in a way to evangelize the Essenes. Let's put up this next slide. This is a uh, this is a photo, brothers and sisters, that we recovered from among the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, we had to colorize it a, uh, a little bit, but it gives us a picture of them at their sacred uh, court now. Uh, just uh, being facetious here, but this, these are modern actors uh, down in the Qumran area, kind of uh, reenacting how they think that the Essenes uh, celebrated their sacred meal. By the way, we didn't even get into this, brothers and sisters, but the Essenes celebrated a meal of bread and wine every day at noon after they washed in water which they believed forgave their sins through the power of the Holy Spirit and dressed in white robes. And then they would go into uh, a special room and uh, share bread and wine together. Uh, so that might sound uh, faintly reminiscent of a world religion that you're familiar with. Um, and there's so much more that we could talk about there. But let's, let's, let's bring this home pastorally. You know, what does this all have to do with us? Well, the Essenes were waiting for the Messiah to come, living lives of waiting out there um, on the shore of the Dead Sea. I didn't mention this earlier, but they expected the Messiah to come to Jerusalem from the east. That's why they went east, and they figured that the route of the Messiah to Jerusalem would come basically right past their uh, monastery. So they're waiting. You know, it's kind of like that... Uh, that uh, uh, old gospel, uh, when the when the saints go marching in, right? Oh, I want to be in that number when the saints go marching in. That's a vision of Jesus's return, right? The Messiah's return and the procession into heaven. But the uh, Essenes had that concept with the first coming of the Messiah. They wanted to be part of the procession that went up to Jerusalem, and that was part of the reason why they uh, made their community right there. But again, let's let's get back to thinking about what they were doing. They were waiting for the Messiah to come. When the Messiah came, they believed he would usher in this era of freedom from Satan and forgiveness of sins, and it would last forever. And in fact, that is what happened. They were right. Jesus came and he ushered in a perpetual era of freedom from Satan and freedom from sin. You might ask yourself, well, how does that manifest itself uh, in my life today? Let's throw up that uh, slide 34, Anna. 
it manifests itself in the sacraments because the sacraments free us from the power of Satan and they, they forgive our sins. Of course, baptism is the first one that does this. Baptism has exorcistic power and of course it cleanses us from our sin. But thereafter, we have recourse to that waterless baptism, which is the confessional. And the confessional allows us to live in an era of perpetual jubilee, to live in perpetual freedom from Satan, because every time we give Satan control over our lives by consenting to sin, we can undo that permission and we can undo Satan's control by going to confession. I, I found this out very personally, brothers and sisters, because I was a Protestant pastor and I was involved in deliverance ministry before I became a Catholic. And um, in, in deliverance ministry as Protestants, we, we hit upon a method that worked very effectively for us. We basically sat with people and had them confess all their sins that they could remember. We had books and books of sins. We'd work through these books and have people confess their sins in the presence of praying believers for up to two hours, just like do a total cleansing of their spiritual uh, system. And we found that that was extremely effective and, and usually made it unnecessary to actually formally call up the demon and cast the demon out because we discovered that if people would confess their sins in the presence of other believers, the demons would simply go of their own accord. They would just leave. And, and people would experience uh, freedom. So I experienced that as a Protestant involved in deliverance ministry. What we were basically doing, brothers and sisters, was practicing what we would call a non-sacramental general confession. A general confession is a long confession that you do on a retreat where you do like a thorough cleansing and you, you go back and you, you do a, a long review and, and maybe that takes about an hour with a priest. Don't do this on a Saturday afternoon when there's 50 people behind you in line. Uh, this is something that you set up on a special occasion. But uh, a general confession, actually, Ignatius of Loyola recommended doing one once a year, doing a retreat once a year, and on the retreat, doing a general confession. And we've lost that practice, but it's a very, very, very good practice, and it has exorcistic power. And uh, Father Gabriel Amorth, the chief exorcist of the Diocese of Rome under John Paul II, he talks about it in his books. You can get his books from Ignatius Press. An exorcist tells his story and an exorcist more stories. You read in there, and Father Moore talks about how powerful confession is. It's the first line of defense in spiritual warfare. And typically, if you can make a good confession, you will not need an exorcism because sin is what the demons use to get a hold of you. And when you confess your sin through the power of the sacrament, your sin is forgiven. That's one thing the Essenes expected Melchizedek to do, but then also you're freed from the power of Satan. It goes hand in hand. And so I, I give a whole talk on parish missions about this, you know, called uh, confession as spiritual warfare. You know, confession is really the first line of defense for us to get free of Satan's power. And as Catholics, we don't often get this. We don't think of sin in terms of spiritual warfare. We just think of sin as like a juridical thing as like, you know, uh, get, getting up on our, our police blotter, and then we have to go and we get, got to get that expunged by the judge. It's not just a juridical thing, people, uh, my brothers and sisters. When you sin, what you're doing is you're consenting to allowing Satan to work in your life, and he gets a hand in you. Okay, every time you sin, it gives permission for the demonic to be active, and that has to, you have to be freed from that, okay? That has to be broken. Those bonds have to be broken. That's why we fall into addiction, okay? That's why we fall into um, the habits of what we call a predominant fault. It's because we give permission for the evil one and his spirits to operate. But when we confess our sins, that denies that per permission and we get freedom. So the Essenes were expecting the Melchizedek to come and free them from sin and Satan. He did come and he made it permanent, and it's permanent in the sacraments, especially the sacrament of reconciliation. So that's what I got for you tonight, brothers and sisters. Hope you enjoyed that, and we can uh, open it up for questions and discussion. Dr. Bergsma, thank you so much, and I, I have to tell you that uh, I love the Dead Sea Scrolls. I love your teachings. I love the scriptures. I learned a ton tonight, 
Um, and, uh, and I had to go in the middle of your talk. I, I had to rip myself away from your words because just this week, literally on Sunday, we just put up the icon of Melchizedek in the church. <laughs> yes. Sweet. Fantastic. Isn't that beautiful? That's awesome. Yeah. I had this painted in Ukraine oh, and shipped wow. over here. And, uh, and then oh, we had a little Bible, Bible study in the church this Sunday after divine liturgy about who Melchizedek was and so forth. This is fa fascinating. And it's for me, uh, kind of blew the top of my head off. So I got to go back and I got to tell you guys that what Dr. Bergsman is talking about, about the Jubilee year. And we, at the Institute, we talk a lot about the Babylonian exile um, and, uh, and, and, and the Jubilee year and the Babylonian exile hand in hand. Um, and it's the key that unlocks the door to Jesus's entire ministry and how the gospel writers, as, as Dr. Bruce was talking about, how the gospel writers are talking about Jesus, what they're highlighting about his ministry is all about the Jubilee year as a resolution to the Babylonian exile. So Dr. Bergsma, thank you very much for this excellent absolutely. presentation this evening. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Well, I, I just have to throw in, you know, in the Chaldean liturgy, uh, they do a ton with the Jubilee and they set up the liturgical year on these Jubilee patterns. And I, I, I saw this a couple of years ago when I was out in um, uh, Southern California at John Paul the Great, where there's, you know, a good Chaldean community out there. And uh, it's, it just blows your mind because it's so intuitive about really what, what's going on in salvation history. Amen. Absolutely. Um, we had a talk, a, a series of talks on the Jubilee year at the Institute of Catholic Culture. For anybody that wants to take a look at that, we'll post that in our post, uh, our post game uh, email to you tomorrow morning. Um, and uh, if you want to dive further in that, not necessarily in regards to exactly what, uh, what Dr. Bergman was talking about, but nevertheless, the Jubilee year, if you understand that, and the Babylon exile, it's going to just open up a whole world for you as to the revelation of the, of the, the coming of the Son of God in the flesh um, and uh, everything we're preparing for. And then what's going to happen is, as, as, as Dr. Bergson was saying, liturgically, everything just starts to make sense. And what the church is putting before us at this time of year starts to make sense. Um, and so just encourage you to dive, to dive into that. Well, um, the first thing... Um that that i want to ask is if you could explain further what a messiah is because some people might have um kind of gotten a little uncomfortable when you said well luke's saying hey john the baptist here's your priestly messiah and then here's jesus like two messiahs are, are you kidding me so could you explain that a little further sure so messiah means uh smeared one it comes from mashach in hebrew which is to smear something with oil so the messiah the in, in hebrew it's the messiah okay and the best we can do is messiah in english but um it means the guy who smeared and uh so three rolls were smeared with oil in the old testament in, in the people of israel that was the priest was and the prophet was and the king was so in its most basic meaning was, you know, a prophet, priest, or king, one of those office holders was a Messiah, was an anointed one. Uh, somebody had been marked for a special sacred office by the imposition of oil on his, uh, on his head. In time, uh, the Holy Spirit led the people of Israel to expect the Messiah, that is like the anointed one who would um, you know, fulfill everything in one person. He would be prophet, priest, and king. But as we see, you know, in in um, in some of the prophets, like we, we read that from from uh, Zechariah and from Jeremiah, there is biblical reason to expect a kind of priestly anointed one who would at least be the precursor of the uh, anointed one from the line of David. And I think that's precisely what, in fact, did happen. And that's what uh, John the Baptist was. That doesn't mean that John the Baptist is divine, you know, et cetera. There's so much more that we understand and know about our Lord Jesus Christ, of course. But in the sense of we see in, in several prophetic oracles, a clear expectation of, you know, kind of a definitive anointed one in a priestly role and in that royal role. And I think that Luke is really presenting um, uh, John and Jesus to us in that way. We should remember, though, of course, that uh, with 
the uh, Davidic kingship, there also came a priestly role. We see David acting as a priest, for example, in 2 Samuel 6, and he was able to do that because he sat on the throne of Jerusalem, and Melchizedek was the founder of the city of Jerusalem, and so David and his sons were understood to be the heirs of Melchizedek, who was a priest king, as we saw in Genesis 14. That's what Psalm 110 is referring to when it says, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. It's speaking to the Davidic king, who was understood to have received the, uh, the, the royal priesthood of Melchizedek by succession by virtue of being king of the sacred city uh, of Jerusalem. So the royal Messiah, our Lord Jesus Christ, also has that priestly role. But as the epistle to the Hebrews points out, it's not the priesthood of Levi, but it's the priesthood of Melchizedek that our Lord exercises. So Dr. all right, can, I'll stop there. Doctor, can I follow up yeah. on that? And this yeah. is, I apologize to our entire ICC family, but I'm actually asked a question myself because it's not every night that I get to uh, stay along because of some of my priestly duties that I have. Um, but, uh, but this is a, a topic that's just near and dear to my heart. And, and um, doctor, I just, I want to, I, I have over, over the years um, uh, understood this, uh, this idea of Melchizedek, king of righteousness, right? Melech Zedek, king of right. righteousness, as more of a throne title. St. Ephraim says that Melchizedek is Shem, right? right. And, and so I've, I've, I've said this in my Bible studies. I don't know. I, I, on, I'm asking this in honesty. I really don't know. Am I on the right track in understanding uh, Melchizedek is more of a throne name of the, of the kings of Jerusalem, right? The, the kings of righteousness, and then what sparked that in what you're saying tonight was that they're looking for the return of not necessarily Melchizedek of uh, in right in Genesis of the, the guy, although they could have understood that in this kind of yeah. interesting way, like they expected Elijah, Elijah or Moses, but, but they're expecting the son of David who is to right. be the king of righteousness, right? Right. Well, absolutely. Just like, you know, uh, Ezekiel will say, uh, David will be their king. You know, and what he means, though, is the son of David. He, he doesn't mean literally like David's going to be risen from the dead and return. But the son of David is David, just like every pope is Peter. So likewise, you know, in 11Q Melchizedek, when they talk about the return of, of Melchizedek, that could be understood as the coming of an heir of Melchizedek, one who is in the Melchizedekian succession. And that could be a son of David because the Davidic line was understood to be in Melchizedek in succession. That is, did you say that was Aphrahat or Ephraim who says? St. Ephraim, yeah. Ephraim, okay. That's fascinating. I, I want to get that reference from you because sure. the Targums say the same thing. Uh, Targum Neophyte, Targum Pseudo Jonathan, uh, they all say that um, Melchizedek is Shem, okay? And you see that in the Glossa Ordinaria in, in the Middle Ages as well. Uh, on Genesis 14, that uh, Melchizedek is Shem. That's interesting because um, if you study the pattern of priesthood in scripture, Adam is the first priest um, placed in the garden. The garden is the first sanctuary. And then the Jews understood the priesthood to be passed down, like the high priesthood over all humanity, to be passed down from Adam to firstborn son, all the way to Noah. And then Shem was Noah's right. firstborn. He's Melchizedek. And then the Davidic line inherits that by succession, you know, in, in uh, Salem, the sacred city, which is Jerusalem. And so that Melchizedekian priesthood in, in Jewish thought goes back to the Adamic priesthood. And right. that is just, you know, very, isn't very and isn't, isn't that what the author of Hebrews is talking about in Hebrews chapter seven? I think that's, I think that's what he is talking about. I, I think it makes perfect sense. I, I think this, this helps to explain now, um, there, there's, there's that one passage in uh, Hebrews that says, uh, you know, without father, or mother, or genealogy, he remains a priest forever. Uh, you have to understand that in, in first century Jewish context, uh, what he's talking about is Levitical father, Levitical mother, Levitical genealogy, because these were, uh, th when you wanted to serve as a priest in the Jerusalem temple, you had to go to Jerusalem and show that your mother was a Levite, your father was a Levite and that you had a Levitical genealogy on both sides going back for generations. Okay, the author of Hebrews is not literally saying that Jesus doesn't have a genealogy, because he's got two of them, Matthew 1 and Luke 3, and he's got a father and a mother, and all those things are true of Jesus. What he's saying is 
not their genealogy, not the Levitical genealogy. It's a right. different genealogy. So Beautiful. anyway. Yeah, thank um, you, doctor. I appreciate yeah. you indulging. And uh, I, have a, I have a book called Jesus in the Old Testament Roots of the Priesthood that goes into this in, in, in great depth if people want to pick that up. Fantastic. We're going to link that, uh, uh, Annie, in our uh, email tomorrow to everybody. Kathy Flowers and our entire ICC family, I apologize. Kathy just texted me and said, Father, that was more than one sentence long. And it, and it, it hardly, I was going to say, we need to get you two together for dinner or something, like listening to the two of you talk. I'd just love to be a fly on the wall. So so for Kathy Flowers' sake, I'm going back to the to the Q&A box. Kathy, I love you. Big big hug from, uh, from across the, the world here. Uh, Matt's asking, how would the Jews um, uh, uh, appreciate or not appreciate a priestly messiah who did not worship in the temple as it was considered by the Essenes to be defiled. Right. Well, a large number of Jews were uncomfortable with the temple because the temple was being rebuilt by Herod, but Herod was not a descendant of David. And only the line of David had the right to build the temple going back to Solomon. It was the responsibility of the Davidic king to build the temple. Um, you see that in 2 Samuel 7, he will build a house for my name. So Herod was an illegitimate temple builder. Then you've got Annas and Caiaphas. They do not descend from Zadok. The prophet Ezekiel said that the high priest has to come from Zadok. They don't. They come from the Maccabean line, because if you study history around the year 152, the Maccabean king, Jonathan Aphis, takes over the high priesthood at that point. And all he is is a Levite. He does not have the blood of the high priesthood in him. And so from 152 BC on, the high priesthood is corrupted and it's illegitimate. Now, a lot of scholars believe that the legit high priest who was kicked out actually went down to Qumran and he refounded that monastic community. And, and many believe that he's the one being referred to in the Dead Sea Scrolls as the teacher of righteousness, as he is the legit high priest. So the Essene movement was all about purity of bloodline. They had among their leadership those that had the proper high priestly descent. And uh, so the Essenes would not participate in the Jerusalem temple, which is being, you know, run by fakers and shams. And, and other Jews were sympathetic. It basically was a really awkward position for faithful Jews at the time. Some were just, you know, what else do we do? We just got to worship because that's the holy place, even though we, we don't like these people that are in control of it. Others are like, no, we're not going to have anything to do with it. We see the Blessed Mother and St. Joseph putting up with it and, and worshiping in the temple because it's, it's the sacred place. But you have other figures like the Essenes who are saying, no, we can't in good conscience participate. So different holy Jews were coming down on different sides of the question of what do we do? But everybody was waiting for the Messiah to come and fix this problem of the corruption of the temple and the priesthood. And we see Jesus doing it with the with the cleansing of the temple, for example, um, he is showing that he's the son of David come to cleanse and take over this, this uh, structure. And, and, but then he announces John 2, 21, the temple of his body, right? And that's also the point of the blood and water coming forth from his side at the cross. That's blood and water flowed out of the temple during Passover because of all the blood, so the blood of the lamb went out the exhaust pipe, washed down with water from the temple courts. Uh, a quarter of a million lambs, all this blood comes sp spurting out of the side of the Temple Mount, out of this big pipe and wash down the hill. So the blood and water coming forth from the temple, that's what's going on in John 19, 34. It's a symbolism that uh, that we usually don't see because we're not familiar with first century Judaism. And that's the key, guys, right there. You get yourself familiar with first century Judaism and you're going to get yourself familiar with the gospel of Jesus Christ. You're going to understand what is being told to you. And, uh, and that's why we spend so much time on these topics at the Institute. Dr. Smith, by the way, and he gave a, a nice talk on um, the Pharisees, Sadducees, and Essenes and trying to lay out the political situation in which Jesus was born. I recommend we'll, we'll go ahead and link that for you guys in these days to come of Advent. Spend your time getting inside the story, getting inside the picture. Right. And not not to not to understand. It. Don't don't listen to Dr. Bergman night from the outside. You got to get on the inside. You got to get into the, the mikvah, like in the in the in the middle of the whole business and and see it all happening around you. And then 
then when you're reading the gospel, the words of Christ can be spoken to you. You're going to be hearing them as you're standing on the edge of the Jordan with the Pharisees asking John the Baptist if he is the one to come, right? You, you, that's where you need to be standing. Um, and, uh, and, and so just these, time, these days ahead are super important as we're preparing ourselves. Is it where there is preparation, my brothers and sisters, there's going to be fulfillment. The Lord's not going to hold that back. If we prepare ourselves, he's going to be born in our midst. Um, doctor, I'm not even going to look over at my questions that have come in because I'm just going to ask you the question because it's repeated over and over and over again in different forms. And that is, were the Essenes aware of, of Christ? Do we have any evidence that this expectation that he was coming was actually fulfilled for them? Yeah, they were aware of him. And uh, it's interesting that the clearest signs of Essene presence are actually in the Gospels during Passion Week, because Jesus in Luke tells Peter and John to go into Jerusalem and find a man carrying a jar of water and follow him. Now, if it's a jar of water, that means the man has just filled his jar. If he's filled his jar, it's mean he's going back to his residence. If it was an empty jar, if he's just carrying a jar, he would be going out to the water source. So a jar of water means he's going back to where he came from. Now, carrying water was women's work. The only men who carried water would be men who did not have women in their community. And the only branch of Judaism that lived in male community were the Essenes. So I'm absolutely convinced Jesus was telling Peter and John to follow an Essene back to his residence, which would be a communal residence where they would prepare for the Last Supper. So I think that's very strong indication that Jesus celebrated the Last Supper in the uh, Essene neighborhood of Jerusalem. Later in Mark 14, 51 and 52, we read about this curious young man who's shadowing the disciples out to Gethsemane, and he's wearing nothing but a linen cloth. And when the, when the guards show up, he flees, they grab his cloth, and he flees naked and leaves the linen with them. Brothers and sisters, that is very strange behavior. Linen was very expensive, and so it bespeaks wealth, but wearing only a single garment bespeaks poverty. So that would be like a self-contradiction, like a guy walking down a street in a pair of Giorgio Armani pants and nothing else. And you think, if he can afford a $300 pair of pants, why couldn't he get a shirt, right? So here you've got this young man who's wearing linen, which was the, the cloth of the wealthy, but he's only got a single garment on. Who dressed like that? only the Essenes. They wore a single garment out of, ascetic, out of asceticism, but they only wore linen because they regarded themselves as a priestly people, and the priests could only wear linen. So 100%, the young man in 14, 51 and 52 of, of Mark, that is, he was an Essene. Tradition identifies himself as John Mark, the author of the gospel, and I think that's right. I think that John Mark was a young Essene in the lifetime of Jesus, uh, Jesus celebrated the Last Supper in the Essene neighborhood. Later, we find out that the upper room was probably owned by John Mark's mother in Acts. We find that information out. So that would explain why John Mark would be lurking around at the Last Supper and follow the disciples out to Gethsemane. And like so many teenagers throughout history, he ends up at the wrong place at the wrong time when the police show up. So he flees naked. And so, you know, kind of na naked streaker photo bomb for... Uh, uh, for the filming of the Passion of the Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane there, and, and he puts that in as a sign of humility. That was his little shameful, you know, role in, in the whole, uh, you know, Passion of our Lord. But so to, to cut to the chase, what I'm saying is there's a lot of signs that Jesus was um, uh, taking refuge in the Essene community in the last days of his life, because they didn't want to kill him, whereas the Pharisees and the Sadducees did. So most of Jerusalem was very dangerous for our Lord uh, during Passion Week. So he, when he needs a little safety, he goes to their neighborhood to celebrate uh, the Last Supper. There's also something about the dating of the Last Supper. We don't want to get into that tonight. But um, there, there's no way that they could not be aware of Jesus' presence. I think, um, I, I think what happened was after the resurrection, a, a large number of them converted. In, in Acts 6, 7, we read that at the very early stage of the church, a large number of the priests uh, became obedient to the faith. And a large number, the, the, the priests were basically either Sadducees or Essenes. 
they had to be there were no priests were pharisees the pharisees were a non-priestly movement the, the priests were divided among the sadducees who were kind of corrupt and the essenes are kind of like religious conservative purists and and so the the large number of the priests that convert in in acts i, I think these were essene sympathizers or, or essene priests uh, who uh, you know who came in? So that that's my view of it, Doctor. That's, that's, uh, I I was while you were talking, I grabbed off the shelf uh, my bookshelf, uh, Barjol Pixner's with Jesus oh. in Jerusalem. I'm sure you're familiar with it. Yeah, yes, this, fantastic. I draw heavily on on uh, uh, Father Pixner. Fantastic. I've been you know I I'm sure you've done the same up there on Mount Sion in Jerusalem. Right. Mm -hmm. That was the Essene quarter at the time of Jesus. Right. And there are mikvahs. If you go across the field by the cemeteries, they're they're all they're all there. Like yeah. you just go walk into the weeds and you're like, there they are. You got yeah. all the waterways and stuff. I can't believe it's like out there in Jerusalem, uh, you know. Yeah, it's both. It's just amazing. It is, it is amazing. So we're going to we'll, we'll put a link to that. Also, I don't even know if this is in print right now. If it's not in print, sometimes it's really expensive. Don't go crazy because it's paperback. Ignatius has. Um... In yes. the footsteps of the Messiah, which I think overlaps with that book and yes. has the same uh, articles in it. it it's a little more academic, and but it's excellent okay. in, the foot, in the footsteps of the Messiah. Um, but it, it really is excellent. We'll post that also. So this one is is with Jesus in Jerusalem. Annie, we'll uh, we'll give a link to that as well as uh, Ignatius Press's uh, uh, reprint of of Pixner's book. Blessed is our God at all times, both now and ever, and into ages of ages. Amen. O Lord Jesus Christ. You who promised that when two or three are gathered in your name, you would be here among us. We ask you to be here tonight in our, in our ICC family, as so many gather together to learn about uh, the, your, your sacred coming, your holy incarnation. We ask you the prayers of the saints that have come before us, that we might prepare worthily for your holy birth that we might behold you in the flesh to glorify your holy name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Amen. May God bless you all.